Welcome, brave souls, to the chilling depths of horror in detail, the realm where the shadows whisper ancient secrets and nightmares come to life. I am your guide through the darkness, and on this channel, we delve into the spine-chilling world of Wendigo horror stories that will send shivers down your spine. First Story Creepy Hunting Encounter so I was recently reading stories on Reddit of cryptids, and I came across one today that seemed eerily similar to an event that happened to me not too long ago. So for context, I was 16 at the time, and my family would go hunting at a deer lease in Comfort, Texas. This was my first year hunting a stand by myself, which I was really excited about. So we got to camp, and first day and night pass, I saw no deer. I was a little disappointed to have not seen any deer at the stand either time I went out. Flash forward to next day, I decide to hunt a different stand in the morning on the other side of camp. Tons of doe but no bucks so I went back to camp and decided to try the stand from the previous day one more time. Keep in mind my first hunt of the day takes place from around 5am to 10am and my night hunts from around 5pm till sundown. So I have my dad drop me off at the stand and he wishes me luck. I thank him and he drove off. The hunt was going great for some reason the bucks seemed to be running towards my feed. I thought they were running after doe because they were in rut or something. Anyway, I finally see a big 12 point and I got it so I'm waiting in my stand now for my dad to come pick me up. The sun starts to completely set so I get out of my stand to go walk and stand by my deer for pickup. But as I was walking something I hadn't seen in my stand was in the woods to the left of me. I heard it first rustling, and then steps finally, I saw its head peer out from behind the tree. A massive buck is what I thought at first. Excited I got on to one knee, and shot at it not even putting my ear protection on. The shot one slashed 10 th the distance from the other deer I shot. Yet when I though I hit. It dead in the chest it stood there totally unfazed before stepping out completely and just staring at me. Here I started to panic this massive buck is staring me down after I shot at it. It's going to charge me I reload my rifle and take another shot. And I reload it again and take another. Still nothing as it stared at me it tilted its head as if taunting me or trying to understand my desperation. Its eyes were lifeless and it began to walk towards me and I finally closed my eyes and shot. At it one last time. I heard it jump, and it slowly walked back into the tree line, its eyes not leaving me once until it was fully back into the woods. The thing that haunted me even more is I swore I saw it smirk at me as it was leaving. Not ten seconds later I hear my dad's truck we throw my deer in truck, and my dad asked what all the shooting was. I told him the story and he brushed it off as crappy aim after a while I kinda convinced myself that too, but now later as I have shot deer off the truck bed while it's moving. I've taken the same kneeling shot at worse angles and hit it. And now I read a story about something called a not deer. And it just seemed so accurate to what I had seen at first I thought maybe a skinwalker but I don't know now I haven't seen it out there since but I was wondering what people thought of it. Second story. Whatever you do, do not read this story out loud. They might hear you. I cannot stress this enough. Do not read this story out loud. Do not mention anything about this story in any audible way. Pass this on via message through cyberspace only. It seems to be the only way to keep your distance without them finding you. Please, 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 for your own safety, do not say anything about this out loud, especially their name. Those that I'm referring to are known by a few names. Navajo culture refers to them as Yinald Lushiai. Some natives in Canada, the northwestern coast, and the Great Lakes region tribes refer to them as Wendigos. I refer to them as skinwalkers. Call them what you will, but do not say any of their names out loud. I say this because they hear their name and respond to it the way a great white shark reacts to a drop of blood in the open ocean. It is not a simple hunt that the skinwalkers perform in a general direction of the audible name. It is an instinct. A drive so animalistic that it is ingrained in every single one of them. Say it once, and you may get lucky that the trail goes cold. That their senses are diluted, and you escape. Say it twice. Well, at that point, you're playing with fire. You're taunting something that not even your worst nightmares could come close to touching. 
They will not hunt you down instantly. No, all things take time in this world. They do not move fast, but they move at a steady pace. They will find you, whether it be days, weeks, months, or years. Well, that depends on just how evasive you manage to be. But don't worry, they all catch up eventually. I'm writing this to you simply because I have made that mistake. Once when I was young, I read the name out loud in a folklore book while trying to sound it out. Strike one. The second mistake I made just last month at a trivia night at my local bar. The question referred to the mythical creatures of terror in Navajo folklore, and I guess after one too many shots, the name slipped out of my mouth. I know they're coming for me. It's only a matter of time. I'm going to keep a running lock. It's the only way I'll stay sane. Maybe somebody will stumble upon this and finally get some mainstream knowledge on this legend. Navajo tribes are extremely tight-lipped about this subject for good reason. Skinwalkers respond to audible sounds of their names. They are like demons from exorcism movies who have proper names. No, these things all go by their standard names of Skinwalker, Wendigo, or Yunal Lushii. For simplicity to save myself the time, they'll be Skinwalkers from here on out. Nobody knows the true figure of Skinwalkers. There's accounts from those who were lucky enough to escape for just long enough. Skinwalkers are genderless, gaunt, pale figures. They stand seven to eight feet tall. At times they move to all fours and crawl around with the grace of a tiger or lion, yet most are comfortable and mobile on their two feet as bipedals. Some take on the shape of a moose head with the long and wide paddle-like antlers. Some purely take the shape of a human face with barely recognizable features. The best I can describe their human appearance is similar to the Slender Man stories of a tall and elongated thin man with no face. They don't kill you, not instantly. They slowly drive you mad. They thrive on the mental breakdown that you begin to feel every time you think you see them. The more that you mentally bleed out with your insanity, the more that come near. Navajo legend is that more appear to quicken the breakdown, but the initial responder is the only one who gets the kill. Now for the fun part. Skinwalkers survive on flesh and emotional distress. They don't destroy a body, only the essence of the human spirit. They inhabit the flesh of those they kill. They walk around wearing their kill's skin, allowing them to blend in among the public. They never look fully there. They look as though they are wearing a semi-expensive Halloween costume. To those that aren't paying attention, nobody bats an eye. But if you really look hard, you'll see the absence of life in their eyes. You'll notice how clumsily they string sentences together. You'll notice that their mouth doesn't seem to sync up with what the tongue is saying. Imagine a museum of wax, with all the perfect collections of human replications, Imagine those being heated to about 85 degrees Fahrenheit, just enough to start becoming deformed. Maybe the wax expands in certain areas. Facial features don't match the mood they seem to be expressing. That's a skinwalker. There's a good chance you've walked past a couple in your life, but maybe you were just too wrapped up in that Facebook post. They absorb your mental distress, whether it's thoughts, emotions, memories, etc., it's been said that they speak to people in voices that are familiar to their prey. You can hear people that have been dead 40 years or hear somebody you just talked to earlier in the day. They are tricksters, more or less. The hunt is more than half the fun to them. The Midwestern Canada tribes depicted the Wendigos as giant coyotes. It's fitting really, they hunt in packs, there's a leader, they torment their prey, and are incredibly vocal. I'm sure you're asking yourself, Damn, this kid sure knows a lot about a legend that the people don't talk about. Well, you know shit, Sherlock. You want to know how I found out? Because these fuckers have found me. They've been visible a few times, but I can feel them around me at all times. I can feel their fucked up soulless eyes on me everywhere. The worst? Trying to fucking sleep. I'm too afraid to sleep with my lights off. There's too much moonlight pouring into my bedroom which only gives me the opportunity to see the shadows fall across my bedroom floor. If I close the shades, I can hear them scratching at the windows trying to get a view. If I leave the lights on, it's impossible to see what's on the other side of the window. 
Do you want to know what's scarier than being stalked by deformed, half-melted humans? Not knowing if they're on the outskirts of your property or if they are right in front of your window staring at your every move. I haven't been able to tell how good their sight is at night. I've watched them at night as much as they have watched me. I don't see the Reaper ever during the day. The Reaper is what I call the one coming after me. I'm not sure if it's the same one, but I can just feel it is. I first spotted it at the edge of my tree line in my yard. It was about two days after I said it for the second time. I knew what it was right when I saw it. It was a milky figure about 50 yards from me. I couldn't just brush it off because it didn't magically disappear like how all other ghost stories have the apparition conveniently disappear instantly. Nope. I had a stare down with that motherfucker for six hours. It saw me, and I saw it. Now, partially the stare down happened because I froze up with fear. I felt like I was in a trance. Something gripped my attention. I knew it could see me, but I felt that it recognized I was aware as well. I sank to my knees after about two hours. Only the top of my head would have been visible. About two minutes after sinking down, it began to slowly move sideways through the tree line, almost as if it believed I had given up. The second I popped up, it froze. I tested this theory a few times, and the result was the same. It couldn't make out the top of my head, which makes me believe the vision isn't as good as mine is. I also do not think the critical thinking is there as I ran through the same cycle about five times without it picking up. The skinwalkers seem to run on instinct alone, patterning their behaviors on what they see. The biggest problem they have is that they do not interact with other humans, they simply float along. This makes them easiest to spot once trying to converse with one. They're awkward, clumsy, and again, the reactions don't match. Have you seen somebody fake laugh? That's how they respond to what they think is a joke, a fake belly style laugh. However, they fail to move their eyebrows, squint their eyes, and smile in a similar manner. I discovered my first and only true skinwalker two days ago while I was out to lunch. I had stopped to open the door for somebody walking out of a local burger joint. I opened it for them and said, there you go, and tried to slip in the door. The skinwalker stopped just outside the door and responded with it, you're welcome, in a big toothy grin, like they were smiling for a dentist taking x-rays. The eyes seemed to be bubbly and watery, almost like how I would imagine a caricatured dog's eyes would look. The skin around them was sagged, yet the forehead skin was pulled so tight. I gave an incredulous look, sort of stunned at how awful this thing was. It responded with that god-awful fake belly laugh. The more intense the laugh got, the more freaked out I got. The face itself became almost hazy, like somebody was turning on one of those anonymous filters in front of it. In a split second, the face snapped back to normal and the thing simply walked off. I don't know, it gives me the creeps the ways the eyes sort of wobbled back and forth. It still makes my hair stand up. I don't want to believe I'm going through this. I don't want to believe that I saw a human-like moose crawling around on all fours, peering from around the side of my shed last night as I took out my trash. I don't want to believe that five days ago, a random stranger knocked on my door asking to borrow a spark plug because his car was out of gas, while holding his hands out in a thumbs-up position. When I told him I couldn't help him, he said adios and just walked away with an ever-so-slight haze around him. I don't want to believe that I'm hearing the voice of my ex-wife pleading to let her in from the cold as I hear faint tapping on my front door. But let me tell you, it's real. It's all real and happening to me here. This isn't like a video game. I don't have some goddamn progress bar to let me know how close these things are to me. I don't know how much time there is left. They seem close, but nobody is moving in on me yet. Whatever you do, do not say any of this out loud. Otherwise, I can assure you, you'll be in a similar situation to me. I'm sitting here typing this up as I can see the skinwalker just sitting on my shed. Waiting. Waiting for me to finally break. To slip up and open my door the next time it mimics my grandma's voice. To say its name out loud one more time to strengthen its hold on me. Maybe I'm on a cusp, just far enough gone to where I'll be hunted forever. Maybe they're taking their time to wear me down. I wish I had answers.
I only have problems. Fuzzy-faced, emotionally disturbed, mutant moose-sized problems. I just went to my bedroom to get away from the scratching outside my front door. Every window has fog on one of the corners. I'm presuming from one of those things breathing right outside the window, steaming it up. I can see one of them right now as I sit on my bed. It's sitting with just the top of its eyes and head visible. The eyes are sunken back into the oversized sockets. I can see the veins in the eyeballs glowing a fluorescent blue, highlighting the inflamed red around the eye sockets. The eyebrows are at an odd height up on the forehead, as if they started drifting upwards from their normal location. I can see it sizing me up. I feel like I'm being tasted via the sense of sight. It started whimpering to me in the infant voice of my brother. Let me in. Please let me in. I'm freezing out here. How can you just knowingly let me freeze? I'm dying out here. Please just help me. Open the window so I can warm up. Please. And shit like that on repeat. It's really doing a damn good job at driving me insane. I'm half tempted to just open the window and get it over with. These things have been in Navajo culture for thousands of years, probably dating back to the times before paper. How I am supposed to stop something that hasn't been stopped in thousands of years? I'm another statistic. The only hope I have is to eliminate their food supply. Everything starves, right? Maybe by spreading this story, the skinwalkers will start to disappear. Maybe they'll go into hiding or a hibernation. I wouldn't count on it, though. They seem to know what they are doing. So for those of you reading this, just be careful. Tonight, tomorrow, next week, next year. I don't know if the skinwalkers pick up on technical transmitted signals. Maybe they don't yet, but at some point they might adapt. So if you hear a tapping at your window tonight, don't turn over in your bed to check it out. If you see steam in the corner of your living room window, don't go out front to check it out. If you hear somebody knocking at your door unexpectedly, take a quick peek first. Pay attention to people's hand motions while talking, their facial expressions and reactions. They're out there. They may be after you next. Slowly closing in on your whereabouts, awkwardly bumping into you, and feasting on the nights that you can't sleep. Or maybe they got to me by time you read this. There's no way of telling. Then again, maybe I didn't write this. Maybe they did. Maybe they do respond to you just thinking the name, saying it over and over in your head. Guess you'll find out. Third story. I nearly escaped a Wendigo at the cost of both of my parents. I kept this story a secret my whole life. I'm 22 now. This happened more than a decade ago and I still have clear and vivid memories of this day. I miss my parents so much and wish I never did what I did that afternoon. I had a nice family. I had a mom, a dad, and a sister, but yet my parents are the ones I miss most. We all lived in a nice cozy cabin in Alaska, United States, near a dense and long-stretched forest. Usually, my parents would take walks just to admire the beautiful snow and cold weather. My dad was a lumberjack and my mom was a normal housewife. We had such a perfect life before the incident happened. One morning I woke up to my sister yelling at my parents because she hated living here. I gave her the benefit of the doubt because she was 19 years old and had her own car but no friends due to us being isolated for miles. This argument went on for 20 minutes before I heard a door shut very loudly. I rushed downstairs to see what happened and my mom was crying because my sister had left our family to move more in the city in a different state. My dad still had to hear this news due to him still cutting trees into smaller pieces out back. I rushed outside and I saw my sister. She wasn't actually going to the car but instead going into the forest. I knew it. My kind sister would never leave us. I decided to follow her and see what she was up to. I quickly put on my jacket, boots, gloves and snow pants and went into the forest. As soon as I went outside I realized only one car was in in front of our house. It seemed weird but I just thought dad had to run to the store and do a few errands, so I ran towards where I last saw my sister. Once I was inside the forest I realized it stretched longer than I thought it would, and weirdly enough there was a path I leading straight. I thought my dad cut these trees due to me being little and not really knowing much about lumberjacks. 
I went on and when I turned back I could still see the house. I knew I would be safe, I would just plead with my sister not to leave and everything would be alright. I wish it was that easy. I walked for what seemed like forever when I heard a familiar voice. My sister, I thought and started running towards that voice but came to a stop. In front of my were long, white, and clean bones shaped like an old Native American roof. There was one thing that stood out with those bones. My sister's pink and gold necklace which had her name on it. I read it, and it was her name. Now I was getting scared I turned around to see my house nowhere. I was lost. I shouted mom dad but nobody came. I ran in what seemed like a loop for five minutes when I heard footsteps. The footsteps seemed like that of a large creature. I ducked behind a log that had fallen and hid to not show myself. I peeked through holes in the log and saw it. This creature it was black head to toe, had blood dripping down its half-torn face. It had large bulging almost human-like eyes. It was standing upright it looked almost seven feet. The scariest thing was I could see the creature's ribs, heart, and what looked like lungs still beating and perfectly in sync. I almost screamed at the sight of its nails. They were long and had points on them. The creature looked around, and when I blinked it wasn't there. Weird I thought maybe I'm just imaging weird things. I tried to laugh it off, but the thought stayed at the back of my head. I had enough, and decided to run backwards again. This went on for another five minutes, when I heard my mom's voice. I ran towards it, and it was near the bones I saw earlier. But the closer I got the more it seemed stranger. Mom's voice was usually kind and soft as well as comforting. But the voice I was hearing sounded demanding and slow. The closer I got the more I saw my cabin, and I then started running towards it when the creature I saw earlier rose up on its legs or what seemed like legs. It was taller when I was face to face with it, its eyes staring into my soul and I thought I was going to die. With lightning speed the creature ran towards me and I blacked out. I woke up. I was alive in my bed and my sister was here too. I thought it was just a dream but noticed she was crying. She was crying in a demonic tone. I got scared and pushed back against my bed. My sister turned around and I saw her eyes ripped out of her sockets as well as blood all around the house. I passed out again. This time I woke up in the forest. I felt immense pain near my arm and realized my left arm was bitten off. I saw it. The creature. He was eating my arm. He noticed I was awake and just stared as I screamed for help. I heard a familiar voice once again. It sounded like my dad. But where was it coming from the more blood I lost the closer the voice got and the more the creature started getting aggravated. I thought I was going to die but saw both my parents. This made me flash back into reality and I realized I was going to have to scream in order for me to be alive. I screamed at the top of my lungs the creature stood on its legs and threw my arm away. He walked towards me and planned on killing me right then and there. I started crying with the last bit of energy I had left and I saw them. My dad and my mom. They were here. I then noticed dad was terrified and was backing away when he saw this creature. Mom threw rocks at it and the creature ran into the forest. My parents picked me up. I was happy to see them the last thing I saw before I blacked out was my mom behind my dad getting ripped to shreds by that thing. Fourth story. Wendigo encounter. This is a repost. I had to fix some spacing errors. I am not sure if this is the right place to post this, but I am scared shitless. After hearing stories and looking stuff up online, I'm fairly sure it was a Wendigo. Me, my son and girlfriend were attacked by something. We were camping up in the northernmost area of Washington. My girlfriend is incredibly superstitious so she insisted we brought weapons. So I had my combat knife and a 12-gauge shotgun, and she brought a .22 rifle alongside a newly sharpened machete. Our son was just three years old at the time. She and I were set on edge from a park ranger, who seemed very tense and uneasy, who stopped us and instead of confiscating our weapons told us to be careful and stay safe, then sent us along our way to the camp. 
When we got there, we were informed that several visitors had spoken about some unnatural noises and a pale creature that would mimic voices and sounds of people who weren't talking or seeming to be distracted. I laughed and put the idea out my mind, thinking to myself, there's no way. They're fucking with us. But I knew better. So we then reached the area we were going to set up camp. We immediately got a fire ready to light and set up our tent and bags. I fed my son as my girlfriend ate a snack. We decided to get a lay of the area, so me and my girlfriend hiked around for about an hour or so. I had one of those baby carrying backpacks and my son started to get real heavy. Everything seemed normal until I saw something down the almost path we were on. We walked closer to investigate and saw drag marks. It looked as if someone had killed a buck. There was a hole outline in the dirt with a small dried pool of blood as if someone grabbed it from the antlers and pulled. That wouldn't be possible for any man to do. The buck, or whatever it was, would have been way too big for that. Shaken, we rushed back to base camp and restarted the fire and hurried back into our tent. Too afraid to leave since it was dusk by now we stayed inside the tent and my girlfriend put our son to bed. Eventually, probably from the exhaustion of fright, we fell asleep. What must have been hours later, I awoke to a faint rasping sound that sounded like a child crying. I gazed outside in confusion and saw the outline of a creature that seemed to be a buck, standing over something. It seemed to be about 20 feet away, but at a closer glance had unnaturally long limbs for a buck and was eerily tall. In sudden fear, I unloaded two shots into the creature and heard a loud blood-curdling C or Y.M. Y girlfriend awoke screaming to the shots I had fired as I tried to explain what I had heard. To my surprise, the animal hadn't moved an inch. Then I noticed the stains on the side of the animal. It looked like blood was running down the edge, and lots of it. It stared at me deep into my eyes as I became petrified with fear. A sinister feeling of dread fell over me as if it knew I couldn't move. I thought to myself, what if it starts to bolt towards us? Just then, this tall, decrepit demonic thing seemed to whisper something. I couldn't exactly tell what it was saying, but it seemed to have said, I need more children. My girlfriend screamed asking where our son was. We blacked out. In the morning, we awoke to park rangers at our campsite. We didn't see our son anywhere. We told the rangers that he was missing, and they started a search party. I explained what had happened and strangely they seemed to believe it. The one who seemed to be older by at least a decade pulled along the one we met earlier and whispered in his ear. I only heard a single line, and I'm not even sure if what I heard was correct. It sounded like he said, it's getting bolder. They didn't seem to want us by ourselves, so they waited with us while they continued the search. We stayed in a log cabin for three days with a forest ranger. When suddenly some rangers came into the cabin saying they couldn't find our son. My girlfriend starts to sob. I start to hate myself thinking that I could have done something if I wasn't frozen in fear. We rushed outside only to find some injured and frightened police officials. The rangers wouldn't tell us anything of what happened or what they saw. Or why the cops were scared shitless. All we know is that we don't have a son anymore. God help whoever goes into that forest next. And please, please don't bring your kids with you. Fifth story. Weird creature spotted in Minnesota. Hello everyone. I'm reaching out because of an event that happened last night. I need help figuring out what my mother and I saw. I moved to Minnesota about six months ago. It's a pretty cold state. More or less, I love it here. It's very peaceful, and when it snows, it's really beautiful. However, my image of Minnesota was changed last night. Me, my mom, and my stepfather were all sitting down watching a movie in the living room. As the movie was about to end, we paused it because my mom wanted to go smoke, and I had to use the restroom. Once I'm back from using the restroom, I go and sit down with my stepdad. A few seconds later, my mom opens the patio door and yells for us to get out there. We rush outside and she tells us that she started hearing the noise of something big walking in the snow. When she started to look around for where the noise was coming from, about 40 feet away was a white trailer. She said that when she looked over there, she saw something with red eyes staring at her. 
she said that it looked like a really big dog. At first, my stepdad said that it was probably a coyote. Then I started to think on how my mom heard a coyote walking in the snow 40 or 50 feet away. I realized that it had to have been something very big. I've always been one to believe in paranormal things. My mother, not so much. We look around for a bit longer then we go back inside. A few hours later, I leave my room to go grab a soda so I can continue playing Halo. After the whole event I've had this unshakable feeling. So I decided to just look outside to reassure myself that she was seeing things. As my eyes skin the edge of the woods I don't really see anything. I take a deep breath and I grab the soda and close the fridge. As I close the door I glimpse out the window and freeze. Sure enough I see a pair of red eyes peering at me through the trees. I couldn't see much because of how dark it was. It was around 3 a.m. But I know what I saw. I saw something that I've never seen before. Those red eyes went right through me. Then as quick as I had seen them, they disappear. What did I see? Sixth story. Believe what I saw was a wendigo. Hello. Uh, Dr. Sebastian, I would like to speak with you. That is what a cold voice said to me over the phone. The voice then explained that there was a family who needed food to be delivered to them. And I then asked why she asked me an astrophysicist. She then replied with, we would really like you to deliver or at least purchase food for them. I could not say no, so I asked her for the location of the family. She gave it to me, and I decided to ask the family what they want when I arrived. I then drove to the location, parked my truck, and entered the small wooden house. When I entered, I got a chilling feeling in my spine. I then drew my firearm and walked slowly while calling for someone. It was pitch black within the house except the small amount of light entering the house through the curtains. I then walked into their kitchen, and that is when I froze in fear. There it was sitting with its legs crossed. Looking at me, it was as tall as me sitting, and I'm around 6 feet 5 5 inches in height. It had long talons, it was skinny, its skin was gray, and its eyes were almost as white as light, but far less bright. I could see its rib cage, and then it spoke. It said in a child's voice, Hello, Dr. Sebastian, how are you? I screamed like a Viking in the midst of war, and shot it eight times in the heart. Its scream sounded like an Aztec death whistle. I ran back to my truck, and left. I knew that thing is what I spoke to, and I knew if I were to tell my friend, he would show up with his entire team, and they would have been turned into its dinner. That is all I can remember, but the way it looked at me screamed I have ascertained your soul, and there is nothing you can do about it. I visited the location two years later with my mates. The place was in a horrible state. The wall had scratch marks. There was urine everywhere. And the only thing we could smell was the urine and blood. As I stepped into my apartment I got a weird feeling. My roommate then greeted me. She asked me what I had done. And I told her that I went with her brother and our friends to an old cabin. Two hours later while I'm trying to sleep, I hear a tapping noise. It was coming from my window, and I knew something was wrong. My apartment is on the second floor. There are no trees for at least 10 to 20 meters, and most trees in the area are short. I did not even dare to move, and then my roommate came into my room. CB, do you have toothpaste? Because I have run out, she said. She then looked at the window, and the tapping speed increased. Don't move, I said. After two hours, the sound stopped, and we both slept in the living room. Seventh story. The Wendigo became my friend. I visited my parents' cabin by the lake months ago. It's not something I like to talk about. I lost some friends up there, gained one very important friend. A mentor, you could say. And I had every intention of having a fun carefree trip. Fuck. I guess in some ways I did. So many memories in such a short period of time too. The sweet smells of people I never noticed before. You go by most people and what do you smell? Some bullshit old spice or axe spray of some loser trying to pick up a girl. But humans are so much more than these modern smells. They can smell like pine trees, fear and hatred, confusion and complete terror. There's a whole universe of sweet smells out there that most people miss. 
I didn't discover this until my trip to the lake. For the first day, everything went like I expected. My girlfriend and a couple of friends were having fun hiking and camping out. We were all having a blast until the rainstorm hit. I've never seen so much rain in my life. It came down in sheets and we barely made it back to the cabin. Kevin tripped and fell. Bobby yelped and said he wanted to go home. My girlfriend made it back to the cabin first. She held the door open for everyone else. Once inside, we made sure all the windows were locked to prevent water from coming in. Trouble was, the roof started to leak. We lit candles because there was no electricity. Fuck, Kevin said. We're all going to drown. Calm down, Kevin, my girlfriend replied. It will take months for the cabin to fill up at this rate. We're going to be fine. Kevin was completely right, except water wouldn't be his demise. Bobby didn't say much. He looked like a scared child in his corner, and he leaned forward on a rickety chair, biting his nails. We were all lost in our own thoughts. Especially me, I think. I was having thoughts I had never experienced before. Thoughts of devouring. Of devouring everyone in the room in a rush of blood and destruction of the flesh. I even started to look at my girlfriend that way, which worried me. They were all trapped here, my girlfriend, Bobby, and Kevin. The rain was coming down even harder, and this little group had nowhere to go. They were completely at my mercy, and I couldn't be happier about this fact. Of course, one had to be strategic. I told them I was tired from the ride up here. I got up, kissed my girlfriend on the cheek, and went in my room. It was the largest in the cabin and I had it all to myself. As I lay in bed, I felt something deliciously dark take over. I knew without having to confirm with some meaningless scientific instrument the Wendigo inhabited the room along with me. Hello, Jason. How are you feeling today? The Wendigo asked. Its voice was gravelly, a little off kilter. Okay. I responded. A little down. Could it be that you have a craving for flesh? I thought about his question. Like really thought about it. Some philosophers considered suicide to be the greatest philosophical question, but I disagreed. The human action most on my mind was whether or not to rend flesh from bone. The horned thing stared at me from across the room with piercing hollow eye sockets. I felt a feeling which seemed so lush and dangerous that I knew it wasn't good for me. I knew civilization was a sham, an abyss of houses, roads, and stop signs layered with bureaucracy and hazy ambitions to reach its peak. Illusions. I'm glad you've come to see the light, the Wendigo said. I stood up, joints stiff, head swimming, but not in a bad way, in a pleasant I'm drunk and shouldn't be driving sort of way. What happened next I don't really like to talk about. It felt good though. I killed Kevin out back with an axe he used for chopping wood. And Bobby? Death by kitchen knife. I ate them both. I picked their bones clean, leaving them so bare and white you could put them on display in a museum. My girlfriend looked at me with such unbelievable horror that I knew I couldn't devour her like I did Kevin and Bobby. I ran away, into the woods. I've killed and devoured so many things in the wilderness that I've lost count. After the cabin massacre, I lived in a cave in the woods for a couple of weeks, maybe a month. The Wendigo would visit me, tell me tales of days long gone. I'd stare into its hollow eyes, get a fuzzy feeling, and I'd have to go on the hunt again. So for a while, the Wendigo became my friend. I was sad and deflated when it was all over. I'm back in the abyss of houses again, trying to think of an ambition that would excite me as much as what I did in the woods that day. Nothing yet. There's not even the thrill of getting caught. I know the Wendigo will protect me erase any evidence of my dirty deeds. I have faith in that. Eighth story. I saw a creature in person and have never forgotten it. Here's a true story of my first-hand account of seeing what I believe now to be a Wendigo I am not crazy, nor have ever hallucinated. I swear on my life this is 100% true and exactly as I remember. It was the night of April 9th, 2023, around 11 p.m. I was chilling in my junk car because it's a good thinking place. Eventually I got really cold and I decided it's time to go inside. 
For context, I lived next to a field of tall grass and behind that, the woods for miles and miles of the Canadian wilderness of Quebec. It's completely dark, airily so, and it smelled weird, like sulfur mixed with burnt hair. I live in a town with a factory, so it's not uncommon for it to sometimes smell weird, but it's never smelt like this. I turned to see what I thought was the neighbor's dog named Indy about 15 feet away from me, so I waved to it. Indy's owner isn't the best so sometimes he's forgotten outside. My intent was to get him home since it was unusually cold out. It walks a little bit, but broken looking, almost hobbling, but he didn't look right. First off he was much bigger than I remembered him, but most importantly it looked like the bones were bent the wrong way. At this point I'm worried he might be hurt. But then it fucking stands up on two legs, like 8 to 10 feet tall, and turns to face me, just fucking staring at me for like 20 seconds, almost shivering in place, I can see that it looks like hair and skin are sagging, falling off even. But I try not to think about it. It takes a single step forward towards me, and I quickly start backpacking towards the stairs leading to my apartment door, never breaking eye contact. I make it up the stairs, seeing it from above on my balcony, and it just states at me. I reach for my door handle and open my door, and I quickly make it inside and lock the door, running to the most secure room I have in my apartment. I didn't sleep that night, and I don't think I'll ever forget what I saw. If it was a hallucination, then how could I have smelt it? Ninth story. Me, my girlfriend, and her mom just encountered a Wendigo. This is the first Reddit post I've ever made, and I'm new to this, but I'm writing this less than an hour after the encounter. I know I'll sound crazy, but I swear this is real. I am 15. And my girlfriend, F14, hung out at her house for most of the day today, and I'm very close with her parents and I see them as godparents. I have a slightly strict mom and my curfew is 9.30 p.m. It's about 12 minutes from my house to my girlfriend's house, and my house is in a very rural neighborhood with every house a hundred yards apart or so. I live in eastern Washington, and there's not many trees near my house. The closest trees are about a quarter mile away, so it's not very forested except for other areas of the town I live in that have more trees. The road my house is on is paved, but there's a gravel road about half a mile long connecting my home road and the highway. It was 926 when we turned onto the gravel road, me and my girlfriend in the back of her car and her mom driving. We had to go slow since the road was rough. There's a couple houses on the left side of the road with a big pasture on the other side. It's so hard to even believe what the hell just happened to me. As you were halfway down the road, a large figure darted right in front of the car. I didn't know anything about Wendigo or ski walkers until tonight when I started to do research. What we saw was a tall slender figure 8, 10 feet tall, with very long slender arms and legs, with a hunched back and oblong head. I swear it had antlers. It was mostly all a gray dark color with no fur at all. I'm shaking in my bedroom writing this right now because this was less than a mile from where I am at this moment. All three of us, my girlfriend, her mom, and I saw the creature. It was not something of this world. It shouldn't exist. I have always been a skeptic, and I was never convinced cryptids of any kind are real. Until I saw the furless figure almost leap across the road. I am completely terrified and my dad's gone for the week hunting elk in Montana. My mom won't take me seriously and my younger siblings are terrified. I've attached an image I found on Google that almost perfectly shows what we all saw. Here it is. I promise you all this is not some creepy pasta or made up story. This is real and I'm genuinely scared for my life. What we saw made me question reality itself and what we as a society believe in. I've read a couple articles about these creatures, and I'm nothing short of terrified. I'm also realizing as I'm writing this that I do not at all sound like a 15-year-old. I don't know what to believe anymore, and I don't know how I'm even able to write this. I don't know if any of you have advice or just think I'm crazy. Is there anything I can do to protect myself from this thing? As far as I know, their only weakness is fire according to Native American legend, but maybe I'm wrong. 
I'm also only 15, and my mom thinks I'm crazy, so there's not many options for me. I swear I'm not crazy. 10th story. Encounter with the devil. Before I start this story, it's important for me to clarify that the paranormal here in the United States isn't seen the same as it is in Mexico, from where my father's from and from who I heard this story. Here, at least from my experience, it's seen as nothing more than a cool and sometimes taboo subject to be into, and sometimes people consider it to be a sort of hobby. In Mexico, on the other hand, it's seen from a much different point of view. It's part of our culture. The same stories our great-grandparents heard are the same ones that are passed down to us. La Llorona, Duendes, Nawalis, Brujas, and even the devil himself. We're taught to treat these things with respect and to never take them lightly. To us, it's much more than just witnessing an old chair move on a blurry security cam or maybe hearing footsteps in an empty room. It's part of our culture. My father is not the type of man to seek attention. He's a humble, honest, hardworking man, and as a result, I wholeheartedly believe him. Since he could remember, he had the misfortune of being more sensitive to the paranormal than most. What I mean by this is that all throughout his life, he has found himself face to face with most of the stories we're warned about. Even now as a grown man, our entire family has grown accustomed to experiencing more than our fair share. It's almost as if this sort of stuff follows not only him around, but us too. This particular story takes place in Mexico when he was maybe eight or nine. He was accompanying his grandfather, who at the time worked as a watchman at one of his friend's stores. This specific store also functioned as a warehouse, similar to stores like Costco or Sam's Club, but on a much smaller scale, Bodega Herrera for those of you wondering. It was around 11 o'clock when they arrived, well past sunset and into the night. My great-grandfather and his friend had struck a deal and whenever he was on his shifts, he could help himself to anything he wanted to eat as long as he kept a list in order to make sure it wasn't marked down as stolen inventory. As they were getting ready for the night, my dad was told that he could choose anything he wanted to eat. My dad was excited to hear this, as it wasn't often that he was given the opportunity to choose anything from the store that wasn't a necessity without having to worry about having enough to pay for it. He wanted to make sure he made the most of this opportunity and decided to go around the store looking for what he wanted the most. He finally made up his mind and settled on a bottle of chocolate milk. He started to make his way around the store and eventually found himself wandering the halls in search of the refrigerator aisle. After figuring out it was in the very back of the store, he hurriedly rushed towards the low buzzing hum of the dozens of refrigerators. After running past the aisles and suddenly turning onto the very last aisle, all he remembers was an indescribable feeling of not only pure terror and true fear but also an endless sense of despair. As he turned the corner, he was face to face with a tall, thin man. My father tells me this man had to have been at least two meters tall. His initial reaction was to try and run away from him, but he couldn't. It was more than being just paralyzed with fear. He felt an endless empty pit inside him as well as around him. He doesn't remember the face of that man and he doesn't know how much time passed. He had lost his sense of where he was and at the time could not for the life of him tell anything except for the fact that it was him and the man in front of him. He does remember, however, that this man was neatly groomed and seemed very well kept. Despite not remembering his face, he does recall that he was staring straight at him. He does not remember what happened after. He only remembers coming to his senses on the floor in his grandfather's arms, being questioned about what had happened. His face was full of tears. All he could manage to choke out was that the man was there, over and over. His grandfather's first thought was that someone had broken in, and he rushed my father back to the front of the store where the only lockable room was located, the owner's office. He told my father to wait inside the office, and that no matter what to not open the door for anyone. He would be back as soon as he checked the store to make sure it was safe. But the memory of the man was still all too fresh in my father's mind and he decided he'd rather brave running into the man again with his grandfather by his side rather than remain alone inside the store again. 
Despite his grandfather believing it wasn't safe, he could see the terror in my father's eyes and complied with my father's wish. After checking through each and every corridor and deciding that the store was safe, they both headed back to the office, where my dad explained everything. For the most part, it seemed to be an isolated incident, as my great-grandfather later that morning told the owner what had happened, and he claimed it was the first he had heard of anything of the sort happening inside the store. It is worth noting, however, that the store was torn down not two months later after this incident, and the owner seemed to give no more of an explanation other than he was losing money. Despite my dad not daring to outright say what he thinks he saw that night, it's more than apparent to me that based on his description of both the man and the feelings that overcame him, I think it's safe to assume that the man he saw none other than the devil. The demolition of the store does nothing but further fuel the theory as to what it was my father saw that night. Thanks a lot for watching the video till the end. Subscribe to our channel Horror in Detail. Drop your opinion slash suggestions in the comments section and like the video as it helps with the YouTube algorithm.